Good evening, my brothers and sisters. In 2012, I was given the blessed opportunity to go to the Holy Land. And when I was there, real early in the morning, we started at four in the morning. We did the Stations of the Cross through the old city. And I was with my father, and I carried the cross. It was a 100-pound cross. See? I'm up front, and my dad's in the black, in, or in the back, in the red. And I got to carry it. And I got to carry it between station five and six. And then while I was in the Holy Land, I got to be the main celebrant at station 11, where they nailed him to the cross. So when we think about this first part of the readings, right, where Jesus is saying you have to hate everybody. It's one of these things. What he's trying to tell you is you have to order your life. Okay? What should the order of your life be? Well, I always joke around with people. I always tell people God, food, and football. Not always in that order. But really, truly, when you sit and pray about it and discern it, yes, God should be number one. Yes, Family should be number two. And yes, three should be what you need to provide for your family sometimes. Having friends included with the family. So this idea of ordering one's life to be and to have Jesus as number one and the main focus of your life. Then when it comes to carrying your cross, like it says in Scripture, Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay? So you're thinking, oh great, Jesus wants to put all this burden on me and I got to carry it. Whoa, 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 wait a, whoa, time out, wait a second. Okay? That's what sometimes we can think because we're human. But remember, did Jesus carry his cross alone? That's not a rhetorical question. Did Jesus carry his cross alone? No. Who helped him carry it? Simon. Simon the Cyrene. My brothers and sisters, God gives us the grace to carry the cross. And he also gives us people in our lives who help us to carry it. Sometimes we don't even recognize it until time passes. Sometimes a long time passes. And as we carry our cross, we're reminded that we need to put God first. Because if we didn't have a cross to carry, or like St. Paul talks about, that thorn in the side, Then we become self-reliant. And what happens when you become self-reliant? You crumble under the weight of being self-reliant. Think about it. Society tells you today, if you can't do it, and you can't do it for yourself, then there's something wrong with you. I would argue differently. I would say, if you can't, if you do it with God and put God first, then all things are possible. And this is where I'm going to tell the story. I met a couple a while back, and they told me this story. Whoop. That happens occasionally. They uh, told me this story. And it happened while they were newlyweds. They were excited, like newlyweds would. They conceived, and they were getting excited. You know how, you know how families get excited? You know, when, when babies come, you know, grandparents start getting, well, possible grandparents start getting the grandparents' disease. I call it grandma disease or grandpa disease, where, you know, 
Grandma walks through the store and goes, oh, wouldn't this be nice for my grandchild? And $50 later, the child has a wardrobe and the child's not even there yet. But it happens. And Grandpa, you know, starts thinking about, you know, throwing the baseball to him, rolling the ball to him, and, you know, putting him in that, you know, Notre Dame gear, getting him ready, you know. Well, you know, let's be honest, we almost became all Army fans today. <laughs> right? Okay, but it's that idea, right? And you start thinking, well, you know, Father Mike's here. You know, we, we got to have some fun, right? So it's this idea of you start thinking about those things. So this young family was thinking about these things and getting really excited and really prepared and couldn't wait. So then, one cold evening, late fall, The weather was bad. Snow, you know, we live in Michigan. You know how that goes, right? And it was a really kind of cold, blustery night. Snow started coming a little bit. At about 11 p.m., the husband heard a scream from his wife. He dialed 911. The baby was coming. She began to hemorrhage heavily. So he dialed the police. The police came with the ambulance, picked her up. She had a police escort. And he called some family. And he went behind the ambulance. They got there. And he was asked one question in two parts. Dear sir, if we don't do something now, we're going to lose both of them. We have to take the baby. And we will do all we can for the baby. And he said yes. So that baby came via cesarean section then, that little baby and that mother got on a helicopter at St. Mary's in Livonia and flew to the only redeeming thing in Ann Arbor, <laughs> which is Mott's Children's Hospital. And back when they were newlyweds, it was the only NICU in the state. And that baby went to the NICU. The next morning, the mother and father sat with the baby expert, and they were told that because this technology was so new, that the baby could be deaf, could be blind, and could be mute. The odds of this baby living without a breathing apparatus was probably in a 10 percentile. So, being the people they were and believing in Jesus, the prayer team fanned out. Family. And the grandparents got on the phone. And they called all over the world. Well, one of the places the grandmother asked her sisters to pray at was called Christ the Redeemer Church. And at that place, it's a place of miraculous healing in Europe. And it's also a place where if a family struggles to conceive, you go there and you pray, and many have conceived. So not only was that child prayed for there, but then they got a picture. And they sent that picture here. They airmailed it. 
So it would get here in two weeks. So in Ann Arbor, in the bun warmer, in the incubator, they put the picture on top. And there's a prayer that goes with that picture. And that mother and father prayed that prayer every day. And they prayed it every day. So a couple weeks go by, two or three weeks go by, and the doctor came in for the update and told the parents of this child that the his throat was growing, growing around the tracheotomy and that they would have to remove it. And if they didn't, and if they couldn't remove it, then he definitely would never speak. So they tried once. The baby stopped breathing. So they put the tracheotomy, they put the tube back in. They tried later that day wouldn't breathe, started turning funky colors. They put the tube back in. Then they said, we're going to try one more time tomorrow. If that is not successful, then we'll do the procedure so we don't have to worry about that anymore. We don't have to worry about his throat growing around the plastic tube. And they continued to pray that prayer. So the next morning, they went to do it again. Exactly. See, you can hear them. They pulled it out. And he began to struggle. But the doctor in his wisdom did something. He pinched him. What does a baby do when they feel pain? They cry. They start using their diaphragm. He pinched him and he began to cry, which meant he began to breathe, which meant his color came back. And they waited. They waited 10 minutes. And this little one began to breathe on his own. first major thing down. Check. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I want to quote, I, I want to do this too, because during this time that, uh, that all of this was happening, I'm going to read a quote from uh, St. John Paul II. And it was actually here in Detroit that he said it at Metro Airport. He said, the best traditions of your land presume respect for those who cannot defend themselves. If you want equal justice for all and true freedom and lasting peace, then America defend life. My brothers and sisters, this baby was born at 24 weeks. This is a 24-week-old model to scale. This baby and he has fingerprints, can breathe, all kinds of cool things has a heartbeat, there he is, 14 inches long, 2 pounds, 6 ounces the baby was born. So as time goes on, the baby hits a threshold of 2, hadn't uttered a word yet. So. Having gone to Ann Arbor every couple of months, they finally decided 
well, we're going to have to fit him with hearing aids because he hasn't started talking yet. And his mother got the attitude and said, he can hear. He just chooses to ignore you because you have nothing good to say. (laughs) Well, ma'am, you're wrong. No, I'm not. He can hear. And the reason she knows this is because she was very close to her son. So they put him in a room with all these new toys, with a double-sided mirror, with the speaker in the, you know, with the speaker in the room, you know, where you could talk over the microphone. So this little two-year-old starts playing with all these new toys, all kinds of excited, right? He's playing, he's playing, he's playing. The doctor goes, Harold. Didn't respond. Didn't even look. Kept playing. Harold didn't respond. Waited a couple more minutes. Said his name again. Harold. No response. See, ma'am? He's deaf. The mother said a couple of choice words that we cannot repeat in front of the Blessed Sacrament, nor should we ever repeat anywhere, and grabbed him by the collar and said, let me talk. So, she said his name the first time. Harold totally ignored his mother. (gasps) Oh, never ignore your mother. Second time. Harold no response. The third time, she was so scared that she could have been wrong, her voice cracked. The two-year-old heard his name, got up, went to the door and started pounding on the door and crying because his mother, there was something wrong with his mother. So the boy could hear. So some time, some, some, some years went by. The boy went to school. He had some health issues, some academic issues due to his birth. And then he began to talk to God and began to discern. And he thought he was being called, so he went to the seminary. Well, as the young man was in the seminary, His mother was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And a dear friend of the family came to visit, a religious sister. And she sat down and she talked to this mother. And the mother began to talk about, his mother began to talk about how excited she was, because in a matter of months, So it's September, and in December, he was going to be ordained a deacon. She was all excited. All excited. Because he was going to answer God's call. Not only was he going to answer God's call, but he was going to see the Word of God. He was going to read the Word of God He heard God's voice in calling him. And then the best part is he was going to preach the word of God. And you think about these things. Well, time went on. And five weeks before this young man was to be ordained a priest... She passed. She fought the good fight. Just like she helped her son fight the good fight. It was time for her to go rest and go home to the Lord. So that priest stood in front of his ordinary, in front of his bishop, 
in front of the priest who taught him in the seminary and preached the hardest homily he would ever have to preach in his life as a deacon. The one of his mothers. Now, another quote from St. John Paul II from the same from the same speech he gave as he left Metro Airport. Every human, every human person, no matter how vulnerable or helpless, no matter how young or how old, no matter how healthy, handicapped or sick, no matter how useful or productive for society, is a being of immeasurable worth created in the image and likeness of God. This is the dignity of America. My brothers and sisters, we have to protect the young, just like we have to protect the old. Now let's go back in time again. Think about that father. Think about that doctor. What if they wouldn't have made those decisions? What would have happened? It's interesting. That child, his name really wasn't Harold. It was named Anthony. If you would, please go to the last slide. Thank you. And that's the T-shirt he wore when he was two. And if the doctors and the father and the mother would have said, don't worry about it, it would have been too much for us to carry that cross with too many question marks. Then you'd have one less priest in the Archdiocese of Detroit. I am that boy. Now, I realize I just put something heavy on your hearts and on your minds, but I want you to think about this. At two pounds, six ounces, I never stopped eating. Can't you tell? <laughs> and my dad will tell you that. He never stopped eating. Once he, once he got the hook, man, once he knew how, what it was to suckle, it was over with. Number one. Number two, my sister will tell you this. He had a great laugh before he could talk, and then he started talking, never shut up. <laughs> so my brothers and sisters, as we pray about these things, as we act upon these things, something that Father Mike said last week is important. And it struck me, a brother priest. He said, Christ is the divine healer. He heals all things and all people, no matter where they're at in their life. And that is the truth. And I know it's the truth from my own personal experience. Because God, God's hands were in that whole process. I know that. In closing, my brothers and sisters, remember, this young baby, this 24-week-old baby, just like the 12-week-old baby, has so much potential to change the world. Don't let society treat it like a bunch of parts. Because deep in our hearts, we know we know as human, being in our, as human beings in our hearts the potential of one person. And all we have to do is speak for that vulnerable person. Whether it's a baby or whether it's an elderly person. The greatest wisdom I ever received were from my grandparents. My grandfather came over here with nothing not even knowing how to speak the language. 
because he wanted his sons and his grandchildren to have a life. That was my nun knew. That was the man who called to Malta and said, we needed Christ the Redeemer. We needed that picture. That was that woman who called and asked her sisters to go there and get one and mail it. See, my brothers and sisters, without us praying and speaking for the most vulnerable, us, as their brothers and sisters, then we've lost who we are as humans. And that's including those who struggle. So whenever anybody sees me and I wave to a child or, or I say hello, there's a reason why. Because I had so many people in my life so many people in my village that got me to this point. They used to joke around with me when I was seven and eight and still in the alternative school because of my cerebral palsy. They used to call me the duck because I waddled. Because that's how I walked. And I was a stubborn little boy it still hasn't worn off, has it, Father Mike? <laughs> eh? But remember, I don't think it's so much stubbornness as it is God giving us the will to live and know what is good in the world. And breaking bread with each other and getting to know each other and what's honest in the world. People. Some of the greatest people I've ever met, I've met since I've been a priest, since I've been a seminarian. And they're everyday people. And they carry their crosses. But they have the grace of God to help them. And they also have friends and family. So in closing, defend life. Be open to life. Be open to that elderly person who comes in and you, you see them and you go, wow, how do they get up every day? Yet when they say hello to you, they give you such joy because they're just happy to be here, happy to be able to worship God. Whenever you see those babies, those little babies, whenever you hear them, especially in church, Give praise to God because they're using their lungs and they're breathing. And eventually those breaths will be like the young lady over there and her father who sings so beautifully or like my voice where all of you would run. <laughs> but God gave us this life. Let's defend it. Let's love it. All life, our own and others. Thank you for your attention. Praise be Jesus Christ.